Good afternoon, everybody. Let me get right into my topic, which is protein losing entropy. Let's start with a quick physiology recap of what happens to albumin. The half life of albumin is around 21 days, about three weeks. Therefore, about 5% of albumin is depleted every day. The GI tract uh, accounts for only a minuscule portion of the total albumin depleted. The liver can upregulate and produce more albumin by about 25%. Typically, in protein losing entropathy, the loss of protein is independent of molecular weight. That is different from nephrotic syndrome. So proteins with rapid turnover, like insulin, IgE, pre-albumin, et cetera, are well-preserved. IgE is of particular use, and I'll come to that later. So when you suspect protein losing entropathy, it's really a diagnosis of exclusion. When you look at the way albumin is produced, if you have poor nutritional intake or poor absorption of amino acids, you'll get, you'll get hypoalbuminemia. If the liver function is poor and albumin synthesis is poor, again, you'll have hypoalbuminemia. There's renal loss or if there's excessive catabolism. These conditions also lead to low albumin. If all these conditions are excluded, then we think of protein losing entropathy. Protein losing entropathy can be divided into three main groups mechanistically. They are non-erosive GI diseases, erosive GI diseases, and lymphatic obstruction. The typical examples of non-erosive diseases would be amyloidosis, menetrius, and you can look at the rest of the slide here to look at the typical diseases. Cardiac diseases, typically constrictive pericarditis and a surgical procedure called Fontan procedure also has been associated with protein losing entropy. Here are three pictures which again describes the typical three mechanistic causes of protein losing entropy. The first one is celiac disease, where there is no erosions on the mucosa. The second one is Crohn's disease, where the mucosa is eroded. And the third one, you can see these white dilated lacteals. That is due to lymphangiectasia. I always used to wonder, how can non-erosive diseases lead to protein leak? Well, there are many mechanisms. And it can be because of increased epithelial shedding, loosening of the tight junctions, capillary permeability, and inflammation. Many of these diseases have an additional factor, which is malabsorption. It is important to remember this because uh, you might see a patient who's got predominant pedal edema and not much of GI symptoms or the other way around. You have predominant GI symptoms and not much of pedal edema, but just hypoalbuminemia. And when you look at the textbooks, there's one chapter on malabsorption and there's one chapter on protein losing entropy. When you look at the diseases, there are so many diseases which are common to both these tables. So that was also a bit confusing for me in the beginning. But that is because many of the protein losing entropy patients also have a component of malabsorption. So you could look at the diseases listed on the, listed on the left side and those listed on the right side, and you'll see the overlap. On the left side, protein losing entropathy divided into its mechanistical groups, and on the right side, causes of malabsorption. When you get a patient with very low albumin, you're going to form some initial impressions on what's happening to the albumin. Where is it getting lost? 
So um, usually it's quite clear, but I just like to point out a few classical findings. In liver disease, ascites is usually more than fetal edema because of the presence of portal hypertension. If there's poor intake, you need to take a dietary history. It's important to look at dentition. Poor fitting dentures are a common cause of poor intake in the elderly. There's renal loss, there's anasarca, and the urine albumin is high, and there's hyperlipidemia. Cardiac causes, usually you get a clue from the high JVP or X-ray or echo findings. There's chronic inflammation, there's fever, all the inflammatory markers like CRP, high globulins, all those are clues. What are the laboratory clues that tell you that there is a protein losing entropy? Protein losing entropy is a non-selective loss of protein. So the albumin to globulin ratio is usually preserved. There is no AG reversal, which is typical of uh, renal protein loss. Often the immunoglobulin levels are low because globulin and albumin are both lost. But one immunoglobulin level is usually maintained, that's IgE. That's because it's got a rapid turnover, a short half-life. If you have a patient with low albumin and diarrhea, you're not sure, like I said, is it protein-losing entropathy, is it malabsorption, Come, coming in the chronic diarrhea spectrum. So you could have a CVID with malabsorption, where you find that all the immunoglobulin levels are low. The way to differentiate between protein losing entropathy or a primary immune deficiency is to look at Ig level. So in protein losing entropathy, Ig levels are normal and the others are low. If you have a CVID, you have all the immunoglobulin levels being low. If CD4 count is measured, it's typically less than 10% of normal in lymphatic obstruction and lymph leak into the gut because CD4 cells are peripherally circulating cells and those cells are preferentially lost if you have a lymph leak into the gut. Steps in evaluation, three steps. Prove first that there is protein losing entropy. Look for cardiac, retroperitoneal and liver disease and then evaluate the bowel. Proving protein losing entropy. The most described or the best described test is alpha-1 antitrypsin, antitrypsin clearance. Alpha-1 antitrypsin is a molecule that's very similar to albumin. It's not secreted into the, into the GI tract and it suffers minimal degradation. So just like you do a creatinine clearance, the concentration of alpha-1 antitrypsin is measured in stool and multiplied by the volume of stool over 24 hours concentration measured in the serum, and then you can say how much of serum is cleared of alpha-1 antitrypsin in 24 hours. And there are cutoffs uh, above which you say it's, there's a leak of alpha-1 antitrypsin and below which is, it's normal. The more commonly done test is an albumin tag scan. Albumin is tagged to technician and then injected. And if there is leak into the bowel, the radioactivity can be picked up in the lower part of the abdomen. It's got a reasonably good sensitivity and a moderate specificity. The biggest advantage is there is no stool collection required in an albumin tag scan. So this is a patient who's got a negative albumin tag scan. You'll see normal uptake in the liver, spleen, kidneys, and bladder. And this is a patient with a positive albumin tag scan where you see some uptake below the level of the kidneys here in the left flank of the abdomen. Now, sometimes we have found that you need to stress the lacteals and make them rupture and leak for some of these tests to be positive. This is particularly true of lymphagectasia. 
So, if you are suspecting lymphangic case here and looking for it, you have to give the patient a high fatty meal before doing an endoscopy, before doing an albumin tract scan or a capsule study, because only then the lacteals will become turgid and show up as white spots. The second step would be to look for a cardiac disease, a retroperitoneal or a liver disease. And the third step would be to evaluate the bowel. One test that can really evaluate many of these things is the MR abdomen. If you do an MR enterography protocol, it will look at the bowel, the liver, the retroperitoneum, the vessels. And nowadays, the T2-weighted MR images can show up dilated lymphatics in the retropetroneum. And that gives you the MR lymphangiogram. So the test that gives you the most yield is now an MR enterography protocol. Uh, then that is followed up by endoscopy and biopsy. So an upper GI scopy and biopsy and a colonoscopy and biopsy. If at the end of all this, your diagnosis is still not evident, then you do a capsule endoscopy to evaluate the rest of the small bowel. And depending on both the findings of capsule endoscopy, then you do an enteroscopy and biopsy from the abnormal area. Remember that earlier I said there are some diseases which can sit as chronic diarrhea, malabsorption, as well as protein losing entropy. So if the patient's presentation is predominantly chronic diarrhea, then you would follow the algorithm of a chronic diarrhea worker. This is a picture of an MR lymphangiogram. You can see dilated white channels around the aorta. This is a coronal section and this is a transverse section. Treatment really is of the underlying disease. So you look hard to find the cause of protein losing entropy. The causes listed have, uh, there are around uh, more than 50 causes listed in the textbooks. So you find out the underlying disease and treat the underlying disease. If it is related to uh, intestinal lymphangiectasia, it is one of those diseases that can be purely treated by dietary modification. So if the patient is given a low fat diet, the fat does not distend the lacteals and make them rupture. Medium chain triglycerides can be used because that's a type of triglyceride that is absorbed directly into the portal vein and not through the lacteals. And the commonest source of medium chain triglycerides is coconut oil. So you should use low fat, but the minimal amount of fat that is being used should be medium chain triglycerides. High protein, of course, because you want to replenish the protein. The problem with an MCT diet is you can have essential fatty acid deficiencies and deficiencies in fat soluble vitamins, which have to be supplemented. There are various treatments that, that have been tried in case series, pyronolactone to control the fluid retention. Heparin has been used where it's thought to stabilize the tight junctions. Larazotide, which is also a drug that has been tried in celiac disease, uh, may work in other conditions with a leaky gut like SLE. Octiotide is probably the one that I've used most often. It reduces lymphatic and vascular pressure. The advantage of octreotide is you can try it at uh, smaller doses initially. And if it works, you can put the patient on a monthly depot injection of octreotide. Uricinide, of course, it's a bowel specific steroid. If you have a primary inflammatory pathology of the bowel, that can be used. Cetaximab is an EG receptor antibody, EGF receptor antibody that's been reported to be useful in many trials. Everolimus uh, has been reported in 
useful in the treatment of primary lymphangiectasia. victims. But I really have experience only using octuotide and virucinib. So that's it from me. Thank you.